Johnny Tremaine, Chapter 7, Part 4 As he came back from Milton, riding the long, lonely stretch of the neck, with the gallows and the town gates still before him, Johnny realized how long ago it was that he had burned his hand and how he had hated Dove when he found out the part he had played in that accident. How he had sworn to get even with him, the lying hypocrite, telling old Mr. Lapham that all he had meant to do was to teach a pious lesson. Now, as he saw Dove daily about the African Queen, he could hardly remember this feeling of hatred, his oaths of vengeance. Seemingly, hatred and desire for revenge do not last long. He had made new friends. The old world of the Lapham shop and house was gone. Yet he remembered old Mr. Lapham, who had died that spring, with more affection than when he had been serving under him. Even Mrs. Lapham now did not seem so bad. Poor woman, how she had struggled and worked for that good, plentiful food, the clean shirts her boys had worn, the scrub floors, polished brass. No, she had never been the ogress he had thought her a year ago. There never had been a single day when she had not been the first up in the morning. He, like a child, had thought this was because she liked to get up. Now he realized that there must have been many a day when she was as anxious to lie abed as Dove himself. He remembered when there was no money to buy meat, how she would go from stall to stall until she found a butcher who would accept payment by a new clasp on his pocketbook, or a fishwife who would exchange a basket of salt herring for a black mourning ring. Her bartering and bickering had then seemed small-minded to him. Now he was enough older to realize how valiantly she had fought for those under her care. True, Madge would make another of those big-fisted, hearty women, but women can be worse than that, he thought with some piety of Dorcas and her craving for elegance. Was she never, no, not once, to eat off china? Always nothing but pewter? Poor girl, she'd not lived too high with Frizel Jr., but Johnny wished her well. Priscilla Lapham, ever since Rab had taken her home and left Johnny to eat six fried eggs by himself, he'd felt differently about Chilla. She had been his best friend during the years he worked at the Laphams, and then for some months she'd been a drag on him. He was not bothered much with her. Overnight, that had changed. He was always looking forward to Thursdays and the seed cakes and the half hour sitting under the fruit tree with Chilla. And sometimes he would see Miss Lavinia light. Then Johnny would hold his breath a moment and enjoy the chill that went up his spine. His feelings for a Santa had changed too, and not for the better. It would break Chilla's heart if the little girl did not live up to her lovely face. But Johnny had not liked it that last Thursday when he had been sitting on the back stoop with Chilla, and Miss Lavinia had driven up in her smart whiskey with a red coat beside her and a Santa wedged in between. It could not be possible a Santa had not seen him, but she had glanced at him and then looked away. Johnny rode through the town gates, telling his business to the British sentries there, then went first to report to Paul Revere. A family of Tories in Milton wished to move into Boston, and had written Colonel Smith about this move. Although a great many of the Whig families were moving out of the town, a great many Tories, frightened by the rough treatment they were getting in the inland towns, were moving in to be under the protection of the British troops. Then, as he had been thinking about the Laphams all the way over from Roxbury, Johnny decided to stop in and see them. He had not been in this house once since Mrs. Lapham and Mr. Tweedy had been so ready to cast him off for the sake of Mr. Light's patronage. The squeak pig was alone in the shop. He had not so much as one boy to help him with the fires or to sweep his shop. He liked to work alone. Johnny saw that he was mending the silver hilt of a British officer's sword. What are you doing here? He muttered crossly at Johnny. Johnny took off his spurs and showed the silversmith a broken rowel. I want you to fix that for me this afternoon, Mr. Silversmith. Yes, sir. Yes, indeed. Once Johnny was a patron, the past was forgiven. If you'll take a chair, it shall be mended in 15 minutes. 
Johnny couldn't help it. He said proudly, In ten minutes, Mr. Silversmith. In ten minutes, sir. He walked into the kitchen. There was nobody about, but he could smell bread rising. He looked in the birth and death room. It was once more used for storage. It seemed strange beyond belief that he had ever lain so long in that room. And in a way, he had died in that room. At least, something had happened, and the bright little silversmith's apprentice was no more. He stood here again at that threshold, but now he was somebody else. Then he went outside to the little brickyard with the coal house, the privy, the old willow. Underneath the willow sat a British sergeant of marines with Madge Lapham in his arms. He had rather guessed the Laphams would side with the Tories, but this was fraternizing with the troops at a great rate. The soldier was not half as big as Madge, but he was holding her in his lap. It is hard to hold even a small child very long in such a position. Johnny thought the sergeant must be very tough. They heard his feet and both looked up at him. Johnny laughed, as did the sergeant and Madge. She said, just so it isn't mother, and she twisted and yearned down into her small lover's eyes. The bigger they came, thought Johnny, the harder they fall. Madge certainly likes that sergeant. Sergeant, dear, she said, I'd like to make you acquainted with an old friend of the family. But Johnny, how you've grown. I don't know whether to introduce you as Johnny or Mr. Tremaine. Johnny had grown. Much of the last year had been spent out of doors and on horseback, and now he was always out in the sun and wind. Just Johnny. Sergeant Gale, dear, this is Johnny Tremaine. They both agreed they were glad to meet. Gale, whose legs must have been badly cramped, picked up Madge as though she were a pet cat and set her down beside him. The little man must be prodigiously strong, thought Johnny, and he liked his ugly lined face. He looked just about as tough as they come, even in the Marines. Madge, whom he had always liked the least of the Lapham girls, was rosy, glowing, and beaming. He had always heard that love was a wonderful thing. If it could make Madge Lapham so pleasant, he was ready to agree. Sit down, Johnny, and tell us about yourself. There's not much to say. I'm making out. Isn't it Santa in luck, taken right into the family like a little sister? Like a pet poodle dog, said Johnny firmly. My, you haven't changed much. You always were sort of jumping on other people. I still jump. How's Mrs. L? Don't mention her, said Sergeant Gale. Ma says I've got to marry Mr. Tweedy. He doesn't want to, and I don't want to. Oh, Johnny, you're too young to understand, and I guess Ma's so old she's forgotten. I can't, can't marry Mr. Tweedy. Not since I met Sergeant Gale. I'll say not, said the Marine. Madge, in case you've been wondering, is going to marry me. Aren't you, you twosome plump soot pudding? The skinny little red rascal evidently liked his lady's plump. Johnny went back to the shop, paid Mr. Tweedy for his work, and buckled on his spurs. He had enjoyed his visit to the Laphams. Mr. Tweedy had bowed to him, called him sir, and rubbed his hands in gratitude for even this small favor. Madge, so pleasant, and the smell of Ma's good bread rising. Goblin, tied to the head of the wharf, was pawing, turning toward him and nickering. As he settled himself into the saddle, the horse moved off down Fish Street. He thought it had been a nice visit, but he would not go again. That was all over. And I think we'll stop here and continue with the next section in the next video. Thank you so much for listening. I love you guys. Stigger says ta-ta for now. Please be sure to click like and subscribe and leave a comment. Bye-bye.